Anybody have any questions before we start today? All right, well, we left off with the exciting topic of money last time. So we were looking at means of payments in kind of the general form, trying to learn what money is and what money's not. So we gave our government definitions of money, which had some funny names like M1 and M2. <coughs> uh, we looked at debit and credit cards and started thinking about, well, what constitutes money and what doesn't? You like to hear my phone or whatever. What constitutes money, what doesn't? We kind of kept drilling down, drilling down, figuring out, kind of ruling out loans and ruling out services and, and other items, and uh, came down to our two measures of money, M1 and M2, that have a mix of different things. But the key thing is that it's all about accounts, money that's on account, and currency that's in circulation. So if you didn't remember a lot of other things there, hopefully you remember that, that it goes beyond just the dollar bills that you may or may not have in your wallet. We've got currency in circulation. Outside of banks is how we define that, plus checking accounts for M1. M2 is M1 plus some more accounts, savings accounts, money market accounts, and some time deposits. Some CDs, certificates of deposits. So one of the things we were focusing in on was liquidity. Which one of these is more liquid? Which one is more liquid? We talked about liquidity last time. I gave you some definitions. You can look back in your notes from last time. What was liquidity? Good, the ability to transfer one form of wealth to the other. So how quickly can you liquidate? And then I gave you an alternative definition. A lot of people just think, how quickly can you turn something into cash, right? How quickly can you turn it into cash? So I just bought some French doors for my house on Craigslist from a guy that lived over in Missouri. And he was whole, his asset was a bunch of French doors that they pulled out of this um, hotel sitting in a garage somewhere, right? So how liquid were those French doors? Were those highly liquid assets or fairly low liquidity? Fairly, yeah, a little low, right? So I was able to talk this guy down. He was asking 180 bucks, and he took 155. So I turned his French doors into $155, right? He liquidated them. So the French doors weren't too liquid. In other words, they didn't fall into one of these government categories. I gave him currency for the doors, and now uh, he's holding something that's what we consider the most liquid asset, and that is paper currency, cash. Okay, so that's the topics we're looking at, is money on account um, versus uh, money in circulation. And I wanna start off today with the uh, three purposes of money. What are the purposes of money? Three purposes of money or functions of money. Number one is that it serves as a medium of exchange. A medium of exchange. It's a means of payment. A means of payment generally accepted. 
generally accepted for buying and selling. That's what we mean by a medium of exchange. Now, have any of you heard about cigarettes being money? Cigarettes. Have you ever heard of them being money? Uh, no, we're not talking about C plus I plus G plus X. Good, I'm glad you brought that up. We're talking about smoking. Camels, Marlboro Lights, that sort of stuff. Yeah, but not where it's falling into the category of money. Does that ring a bell for anybody on smokes, cigarettes? Prison. prison the prison system, right? You may have seen a few movies on that or some different uh, cases. Julian, why don't you come around? Okay. Um, you don't have much of an angle there to copy notes. You can come right through here. Got lots of depth. Okay. Um, so in the prison environment, do they allow cash? No. No. So cigarettes are money. Cigarettes are money. Is this? money in China. No, it's not generally accepted by the Chinese people for transactions. It doesn't serve as a medium of exchange in <coughs> China. So you need to think about the context in which you are living on what defines money and what doesn't. This isn't always money. It is money if you live in the United States and you're not in jail and you're pretty much circulating around the uh, 50 states of the United States, then yeah, you've got yourself some money if you're holding that stuff. But it's not in every context. So in the prison system, cigarettes can be money. So they serve as a medium of exchange. Um, number two, they can serve as a unit of account. A unit of account. So the idea here is quoting uh, quoting goods value in a common unit helps measure relative price or relative worth. So for example, if the price of a Mountain Dew is two bucks, and the price of a bag of Doritos is four bucks, what's another way of looking at the price of the bag of Doritos? Two Mountain Dews, right? So it allows us to easily compare the two. Um, and if we looked at the relative price, the relative price of one good for the other is the ratio of the two. We've done a little bit of ratio type stuff. If we take the price of Doritos over the price of uh, Mountain Dew, we get four, wait a second, I want to do this a little differently. We get four dollars for every bag of Doritos and we got two dollars for every bottle of Mountain Dew. I did it a little goofy here so that we can take four divided by two is two, but two what? Two Mountain Dews for every Dorito. If we take this little expression, we got a fraction in the denominator, dollars times Dorito times Mountain Dew over dollars, the dollars cancel. And what we're saying is that two Mountain Dews can be traded for one bag of Doritos. Just kind of a little more formal. The reason I want to do that is not just to waste your time thinking about uh, these relative prices for this chapter so much, but the next chapter we're going to get into exchange rates. And we're going to be expressing the bag of Doritos in terms of the Chinese Yuan and American dollar. And we're going to use that technique to think about, well, what are we really getting 
Dorito for Dorito or Mountain Dew for Mountain Dew. So two Mountain Dews for every bag of Doritos. The relative price of the Dorito. Okay, so unit of account. It's kind of handy for measuring that. Number three is a store of value. A store of value. Cigarettes smoke about the same today as versus a week from now. About the same. Yeah, right? So you get about the same amount of benefit from the tobacco and the cigarette one week from now, maybe even two weeks from now, depending on how finicky you get. You probably can't hold on to it for a year. Maybe it's, I'm not a smoker, but maybe it starts to get a little stale eventually. But for the most part, it serves as a store of value. If I tuck this $20 bill into my wallet, and pull it out two weeks from now, did it maintain its value for the most part? Yeah. Now that's where we gotta be cautious is because if I tuck this in my wallet and pull it out five years from now, can I buy about the same amount of stuff I could? Now we're starting to diminish the purchasing power of the dollar, right? So there is relative store of value, but it's not maybe a great place to be putting your wealth into the form of currency. But for the most part, it holds its value uh, relatively well. In some countries where inflation has gone to hyper levels, um, that is not the case. So I've got some data here on country you may have heard about, possibly. So hyperinflation is 50% per month. So if the Mountain Dew cost you two bucks today, what does it cost you next month? 50% inflation, this is kind of what economists use as a general gauge for hyperinflation, 50% per month. So what's that $2 Mountain Dew gonna cost me next month? Three bucks, right? So it starts going up pretty fast. You hold on to that 20 and you're not gonna be buying as much Mountain Dew. So here's some data on uh, Zimbabwe. It's had some problems over the years, especially the last 10 years. So it's inflation rate on January, this is the monthly inflation rate, on January 5th, 2007 was 13.7%, 13.7%. So pretty high, but the United States has had rates that high, by the way, back in the 70s. So high, but not, well, no, that, I'm sorry, that's the monthly rate. So no, that, that's still way high, but not to hyper levels. Uh, six months later, June of 2007, 207%. Six months later, this is month by month, I'm skipping down a little bit, 5,250% per month. Divide that by 30, and that would give you per day. So six months later, 493,000% per month off the charts, right? Zimbabwe money, the dollars, were just about meaningless. We'll get to reasons why countries can get to that point, uh, but the dollar is meaningless. So what do you do when your employer, let's say, pays you and John works for me, and I said, John, you put in a hard day's work, and we're in Zimbabwe now, and we're experiencing that. I write him his paycheck, what does he go do? Spend all of it, and how soon? You run to the store, right? Literally in these places they, where there's been hyperinflation over the years, they don't mark prices on the, sh on the shelf because they're changing them, sometimes hourly, or sometimes at, at the every half day moment, they're ramping up prices, seriously. Kind of crazy that we would even think that's happening, but um, it can happen where your monetary system gets out of whack. And we'll, we'll start to uh, show some 
reasons why that could happen. Okay, so store a value is the idea that you can reasonably hold on. So money is a convenient, a convenient way to store wealth for transactions. A convenient way to store wealth, usually for transactions. but not a good investment. So when you, you know, graduate from OU and you're having a talk, you're five years, 10 years down into your new position, you got, maybe they've got a 401k plan and you know, I don't wanna hear that, well, I've got my money in US currency. That's where I keep my, I save 15% every paycheck, but I've got the safe bet. I've got it invested in currency. At my house, I have a safe with a stack of $100 bills and a little bit under my mattress. Not a great place to put your money, right? So it is a store of value, and it's a good way, it's a way for transactions to store your wealth, but not, not a great investment. OK, questions or comments on that? With my other sheet, was I wandering around? But I switched. Aha. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our system next. So our government measures money this way, but currency and the banking system is relatively new. It's actually about a hundred years old. So that's kind of a, a new thing. You might, you might have just thought uh, that the system was always the system here, um, but it's not. So the banking system, as we know it today, as we know it, is relatively new. So we have the Federal Reserve Act. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913. 100-year anniversary. And this basically created our uh, national bank. This created the central bank of the United States called the Federal Reserve. or we will affectionately call it the Fed. And that's how the news media will typically portray it, the Fed. So uh, we had money prior to that. We had various forms of currency. We had rich people. We had poor people. We had all kinds of things going on that's very similar to what we have today. Uh, but a banking system continued to fail. So prior to 1913, rich people uh, formed banks and loaned money. Maybe in some ways not so dissimilar to what, what's going on today. But those systems tended to fail. And the, to see why they failed, we need to think about how banks make money. So how do 
banks make money. So let's, I want to hear from you guys. You guys have an account. I threw a show of hands. Most of you have some sort of accounts and you know a little bit about banking. How do banks make money? Interest, Interest okay, on what? Yeah. On loans. How else? Fees, we've all been hit with those doggone fees here and there. So we might have fees for the account, we got late fees, we got bounce check fees. So fees are a, a big source of revenue. Okay, so let's drill a little bit deeper on the interest on loans part. How do they really make money? What's the other, that's kind of one side of the equation to them making money. Okay, charge a higher interest rate than what they're giving out, right? Because what they're also facilitating is you having a savings account with some money there, right? So there's a spread going on. There's an interest on loans, but there's also interest on deposits. Some checking accounts don't offer any interest, but some savings accounts offer in today's world, very, very, very little, a fraction of a percent typically right now. And the key to them making money is the spread. So they make money on the spread. The spread between the interest that they're paying on deposits and the interest they're charging on loans. So for example, a house loan today is remarkably low, historically low. It's so low, it's hard to believe. Um, but one example might be that you can get a house loan for 4%. Whereas if you go deposit and open up a, a savings account, you might be getting, let's just say, 1%. And you're lucky, yeah. This would be on a, like a time deposit, a certificate of deposit, where you're uh, getting a little bit more. So it definitely is. Uh, if you're getting a percent, you're doing pretty darn good. So the spread is 3%. Now, is that all pure profit? So if they've got a million dollars out there um, and they, they're getting 3%. Is that whole spread all pure profit, pure gravy? What do they got? They, have they got employees, the people that collect your money at the teller. So they got all kinds of operating expenses, just like a normal business does, right? They have maybe rent on a building or they own the building. They got maybe even a debt on the building, whatever. So they have some sort of operating expenses, just like any other business does. So this is on the revenue side of their business is collecting money on the spread. Okay, so maybe you're starting to catch on to something here. If you guys put in $10,000 on deposit and get paid 1%, what are they doing with your hard-earned money, your hard-earned 10,000? They're loaning it out. So when you go to get your money, is it for sure there? No. That's usually the big eye opener in money and banking here and uh, the monetary system. Your money is not there. They're not sitting on it, similar to where I said it's not a good investment for you to shove it into your mattress or shove it into the vault. That big vault that the bank has doesn't house everybody's money, of course. It's out earning money too. So if they go out and do that, is it safe for them to loan out all 10,000? No, because you might want a little bit of your money. Maybe you don't want the whole 10,000, but if you're gonna buy a flat screen TV or something, you might come out and grab $1,000 to pay for that purchase, right? So they kind of play a game of how much can I keep on hand to satisfy my depositors and how much can I loan out for things like houses and maybe other consumer goods where if I 
if this guy comes in for their money, can I easily go to Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner and say, hey, I need that 10,000 back. Uh, Jocelyn came in for funds, sorry. No, heck no, of course not, right? So that's part of the game they're playing on, money out the door versus uh, money in. All right, so this is a fractional reserve system. So the banking system is a fractional reserve system. Fractional reserve system. What that means is a fraction of the deposits are being loaned out. A fraction, not 100%, but something smaller than 100%, a fraction of total deposits are being loaned out. Okay, so who's seen A Wonderful Life? It's A Wonderful Life. It's like old Christmas show. Um, you know, it was funny. I, I never watched that show for the longest time. I knew it was always on. I think I caught bits and pieces of it. I'm kind of anti-black and white uh, shows in general. So if I'm flipping through channels, I see black and white shows. I'm like, eh, that's old. I don't want it. Well, now I've come to appreciate some of those old shows. So anyway, we're flipping through a, It's A Wonderful Life. And what happens in that show? What happens in that show relative to the banking system? Towards the end, what does our main character, who's our main character? Remember his name, Henry? George? George. It's George, isn't it? I didn't watch it this last year, so I don't totally remember the whole thing. But do you remember the type of business George was in? What did he do for people? He was a banker, yes. Savings and loan type of place. Yeah, since we're talking about this, that would make sense. So um, people were hearing some rumors about old George. What was the rumors that were being spread around town? What's that? Uh, it wasn't cheating, but it was some problems with money. Yeah, there was some rumors going around town that he was uh, losing money and going to be kind of out of business, right? So guess what people did on that last scene, or not the last scene, but towards the end of the movie. What were they doing when they thought George was having trouble? The rumors were spreading. What did they want to do? He was a banker. What? They were trying to pull their money out. So they were all running to the bank and they're saying, I want my deposit, I want my 10,000, I want my 1,000. Whoever gets there first, they understood the system. He has some money in that big vault that we see, but he didn't have everybody's money. And so when he comes in, he's like, oh, well, Martha, your money went towards Jim's loan. And, and Susie, what about you? You're, I don't have your money here because it's in the form of... Sorry, that's my bad, Henry Fonda. If you remember Fonda's voice in there, I'm not, not too good on the acting, but he doesn't have their money, right? So it was kind of a, a, a situation that wasn't uncommon prior to 1913. Rumors would start to spread that the rich person or whoever it was was going under. Maybe there was uh, some bad business deals or could be some, in some cases cheating on, you know, whatever. But there would be a run on the bank. So we call that a bank run. When everybody runs to the bank, like, oh, I'm going to get my money. I'm going to be there first. We call that a bank run. So bank runs were often started through rumors and cause bank failure. If everybody comes, George doesn't have all their money, and so the banker goes bankrupt or can't service them. And then all of a sudden people say, oh well, boy, I'm not going to put my deposit with George. I'm not going to put my deposit with anybody. It's much safer in my mattress, even though I'm running the risk of fire. 
at least I know where it's at and it's not going to uh, get put into this type of situation. All right, so in order to uh, uh, economists and business people and, and other people saw the value of having a solid banking system in terms of the ability to uh, make loans for longer term purchases. And so the government stepped in to kind of be the banker's bank was the original intention of the Federal Reserve. So the Fed was created initially to be the banker's bank. The banker's bank. So if you think about what that means, on our island, if we've got a number of banks spread out throughout the United States, and each one of these banks is required to keep some money on reserve, let's just put one in New York over here somewhere, each one of these guys has to keep some money, like their depositors, on account with the federal bank, the Federal Reserve, if all of these guys, way from California, down from Florida, Boston, all over, everybody chips in a little bit of money and puts it into the federal bank, then when this happens, when somebody makes a run on George's bank because they hear old George is failing down here in Texas, the government has enough money from all the other banks to make him whole and say, hey, no problem, depositors. I know, oh, yeah, it sounds like the rumors might be true. We've got everybody's money. Don't worry about it. All 10,000 of it, just keep coming in. It's here. No problem. We'll get you. You're taken care of, right? Because we've got kind of an insurance program going on, essentially, by having bankers forced to hold some funds with the federal government through the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, questions or comments on that? So, potentially, if every bank in the world had a run on it, the system would still fail. It would still fail, totally. Yeah, and it, that was a bit of a scare here. Now, in the grand scheme of things, there's one thing that the Federal Reserve could fall back on, even though you're right, it could fail in theory. The Federal Reserve has the power to, to do this, come to their, ooh, this is a new prop come to their little machine here and go, no, I got your money, it's right here, right? They can print off money. They control the money supply. So we can always just print off more, hit the old printing press and, oh yeah, no problem, here you go, right? Run the printing press. So in theory, the government never runs out of money. Now, what do you think happens when the government runs the printing press like that? If they just say, oh, we got, we need to buy stuff. We need some weapons of mass destruction. I know the, the public's kind of against having uh, government deficits where we're not collecting enough taxes. They don't like taxes. Well, I got an idea. How about we just go, oh, I'll take a couple packs of AK-47s. I'll take a, a new airplane from Kansas. Right? We just run the printing press. What happens? The value of the money goes down, right? So inflation goes up. Inflation goes up, the value goes down. So that is Zimbabwe. That's exactly what Zimbabwe did. They just started printing off money. Oh, well, we can't, in, in their case, they couldn't collect taxes from people. So other countries, us Americans are kind of weird, by the way. We just voluntarily, okay, I gotta pay my taxes. Here you go, here you go, government, here you go. We just kind of follow the rules that way. In other countries around the world, what? You want me to pay you tax money? This is my money. Screw that. I'm just not paying. And they just don't pay. And it's like, how do you get people to pay? So that's, that's a whole different cultural type thing going on that the United States has been pretty good about paying their taxes. And so that leads to the system we've got. All right, so running, running the printing press is not generally a good way to run the government and pay for spending. 
Okay, so that uh, kind of long-winded answer to Rachel's comment there. But real quick though. Yes. Like China and Japan, when they run up, or start printing off money, and uh, other countries just send out warnings. Mm -hmm. And other countries what? Just send out warnings because it looks like they would inject their money into the system. Nothing really happens for them. So why do you see anything happen to us? Um. Well, each one operates independently, so the yuan, and, and once we get into the next chapter, we'll look at the dynamic between the two countries that are trading with each other. So I'm not sure if I'm tracking with your, your question exactly, but, but each government can make their own decision, and then the value of the US dollar versus the yuan or some other country or Zimbabwe, is, that's going to be <coughs> out of whack with exchange rates once we get to that material, so. Um, Okay, so let's see. I feel like I was going to write something down. Fed was created to be Bankers Bank. So um, each bank, and then I want to add now financial institutions. There used to be an important distinction between a savings and loan and a commercial bank and, and some other lenders. Um, so we're going to use bank a little generically to capture credit unions, all of those, uh, each bank must keep some fraction of deposits as required reserves. This is the term you need to know, required reserves. RR, -R, big RR. -R. Each bank is required to keep some fraction of deposits as required reserves. They got two places to put that. They can keep them on account with the Fed, or as bulk cash. That counts as money not lent out. So on any given day, if that magic percent is 10%, the Federal Reserve can go audit their books and say, hey, you've got $3 million on deposit in the form of checking accounts and savings accounts and time deposits. And we're requiring you to hold 10% of that back. You can loan out 90%, that's fine, but you gotta be holding back 10%. What form does that need to take? Well, you can have essentially an account with the Fed or all the cash in your vault. Those two things have to add up to that percent. So for example, if the required reserve ratio, uh, if the required, and I'm throwing another term at you here, so required reserve ratio I'm going to do triple little r, if the required reserve ratio is 0 0.1, 0 0.10, then 10% of total deposits must not be loaned out. The required reserve ratio is 0 0.10. That just means 10% of total deposits must not be loaned out. <laughs> All right, so your amount of required reserves is equal to your required reserve ratio times total deposits. Putting on some equation goggles here. I've got $3 million on, a, on account at my bank. 10% must be held back. 300000 is the dollar amount that needs to be held back. <coughs> so if this is $3 million and this is 10%, then that would mean you've got $300,000 that must take the form of vault cash or deposits at the Fed. 
hopefully through kind of trial and error, whatever that percent is that's set by the government, by the way, is enough to facilitate normal business. You come in, you want your 10,000, you got your 10,000. As long as everybody doesn't come in for their 10,000, then there's problems. All right, questions on that? Okay, so the, uh, the Fed, uh, Fed system has some employees involved. And it's run by a seven member board of governors. A seven member board, so it, it's, a, it's a committee that ultimately controls the supply of money. These seven people determine how much of this is floating around the United States. Pretty powerful group, right? One of those seven people is the chair. And who is that currently for the United States? Ben Bernanke. So one of these is the chair of the Fed. And today that is Ben Bernanke. He just got renewed. He did a four-year term, and he just got renewed for another four. So the chair serves a four-year term. Serves a four-year term. The other six members of which he's kind of one of them, by the way, um, serves a 14-year term. A 14-year staggered term. So what we mean by staggered is that when one comes due, they don't all come due. So it's staggered over that 14-year period so that we don't have a bunch of members coming do all at once. The reason that's important is that the Federal Reserve Board of Governor members are appointed by the president. Appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So these are appointed by the president. That would be President Obama, the big president, the top cheese here in the country. Appointed by the president. And we don't want one president filling up the whole Federal Reserve all at one time. So that's why we have staggered terms, so that it doesn't put too much power into one particular president, so that it's, there's some consistency over the 14-year run. Now, a couple of little highlights. Most Federal Reserve governors do not serve the full 14 years. Once they've served on the Fed Board of Governors, their uh, human capital, the value of human capital, all of a sudden goes up dramatically on places like Wall Street. If you've been on the inside track to this group, you're pretty valuable to some big time financial places. And so the, uh, the chair of the Fed gets paid second to Barack Obama. Uh, around what is, what is Barack getting paid? Anybody know? Because it went up recently. It used to be two. Is it still two? I think it's two less. Two? <laughs> oh, no. Let's not go there. All right. So is it 240, 250, 300, 400? OK, they ramped it up to 400. Back in the old days, it was, it was much less. The second highest paid person in the government system is the chair of the Federal Reserve. Now, when you go to Wall Street after working in one of these, so my point with that is that these guys are paid somewhere less than that, you're gonna be getting a paycheck for a million plus easy. You'll be getting paid a million easy. So um, people serve their time, do their public service, and then 
the 14 years all of a sudden looks like kind of a long time sometimes, right? When you got opportunity cost goes up. So they typically uh, don't spend the whole time there. And, it, and so if somebody leaves early, then whoever that president is, of course, uh, ends up appointing a new member. Now, uh, we have a former Federal Reserve governor that graduated from Ottawa University. That is Wayne Angel. So he also created my position here. So I am the Wayne Angel Chair of Economics. That was partly due to Wayne donating a million dollar gift quite a way. So he took some of that salary that he earned on Wall Street after he left the Federal Reserve and he plowed it right back into this institution and he's done other things as well. So Wayne Angel was one of these seven guys. That's pretty uh, un unheard of for a small school like this to be getting somebody to serve in that capacity. Quite an honor. Um, so just thought I'd highlight that for you. There are <coughs> 12 Federal Reserve Banks scattered throughout the nation. So I know some of you, how many people took a tour? I guess you can take a tour even without me. I went, wait, I took a group of students to the Federal Reserve last uh, semester. How many people have been to a Federal Reserve Bank, even with or without my class, but just at some point? Yeah. They're kind of fun to go to. You get to see piles of cash and carts of things, and, and, and it's, a, it's a good tour. I think it's good for every American to see what's going on with all this stuff that runs through our fingers all the time. So there are 12 uh, Federal Reserve Banks. And if you pull out your <coughs> wallets or purses, if you got some currency, I know a currency, this, is, this little exercise is getting harder and harder to come by, it will tell you where that bill was printed or where it came, where it originated from. Now some of the new ones aren't doing that quite as much, but pull out some money and let's see if we can nail, usually with a, a class of this size, we should be able to get each one so on this little thing here, on the front side of your bill, I've got San Francisco. That is one. So why don't you name them off what you got. So right on this little emblem here on the front side of your $1 bill, down on the lower part right on, written in the rim there, I've got an Atlanta was another one. What is it? Richmond, good. What else? New York. New York. St. Louis. St. Louis. Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> KC, that's the one we went to. The United States. No, that's not one. What's that? Which one did you say, Chelsea? Pennsylvania. It should say the city on there. Yeah, on the newer bills, they, they, they've changed that. Philadelphia. That sounds good. Any other ones? Uh, Boston. Boston. I'm, I'm just looking for ones we have. I'm just kind of curious if we can fill out the 12. Minneapolis. But I'm not asking to guess where they are. I was kind of hoping to see what we have in class. Cleveland. We're getting close, aren't we? So is that it? Did, did we run out of bills to actually fill out the run? Dallas, I think, is on the list. I can't even remember them all myself, honestly. What, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, Dallas, I think, would be, I think there's the Dallas Fed. That would be our 12. All right, we'll pick up there next time.